the more space becomes civilization's backyard, right. the more that becomes its own business enterprise. In 2001, mm -hmm. I was appointed to a commission by President George W. Bush to study the future of the American aerospace industry, which was on hard times. They had lost a half a million jobs in the previous 10 years. Wow. And so the government was worried, what would the future of America mean if we lose our aerospace industry? What effect would it have on our commerce? You order something from Amazon, it's on your steps the next morning. Exactly. An airplane got it there. Right. Okay? So on commerce, on transportation, and on our security. So I'm one of a 12-member commission. And I had never before seen a completely learned, intelligent collection of people spread across a political spectrum with one common goal in mind. Right. How do we preserve and protect this industry, or do we just let it go and focus on other priorities? And I thought to myself, this must have happened in other countries and at other times throughout the history of civilization. Smart people coming together, informed people coming together in the interest of national priorities. And then I thought, what role would my people have played in the past? My, my astrophysics people. Right. <laughs> Your squad. Uh, my, my peeps. Your astro squad. Uh, my astro peeps. <laughs> what role would they have played? And that got me thinking, and so I started doing some more homework on this. I had some sense already, but to do it in a more formal way, there it was. Dominance, empire building, hegemony, love that word, hegemony, mm -hmm. was enabled, empowered by my professional ancestors. With the accessory to war in the book, it highlights the overlap between the military and uh, scientific advancement. And so outside of acknowledging that that overlap exists, what can we glean from this relationship between the military and astro astronomers, astrophysicists? What I'm adding to this knowledge, very well established knowledge about the relationship between innovations in science and technology and the waging of war, is that there are branches of science such as astrophysics that have been fundamental to empire building that generally no one talks about. Mm -hmm. Not that it's secret, it's just not the first thing you think of when you're waging war. I try not to tell you how to think about this information. Yeah. I'm sharing with you, exposing for you, a relationship, a two-way street. You will make of it what you want or wish. For me, the, the, the dissonance the early dissonance came about because my field is fundamentally sort of liberal anti-war. So the fact that we are complicit in this way is, this, for me, it's a little bit of cognitive dissonance. Is there a difference in innovation when it's from a crisis standpoint versus just pure curiosity? Oh, like which, what, which do you think completely feels be the best innovation? What actually happens in my field is we will innovate with or without military inspiration okay the military innovates more when there is conflict than when there's not conflict so yes we would benefit more when they're in conflict but we're benefiting in ways that we're not even projecting or predicting if it comes fine if it doesn't we're not going to miss it right now what we do is we just innovate and then here's something cool we like this we publish it now it's openly available military takes it we, we can't control what they take and what they don't take because we publish in an open environment. But here's where the difference is. Military funding vastly exceeds scientific funding. So there is science that can only happen piggybacking military projects. Right. Can I give you an example? Please do. 1957, Sputnik flies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Americans lose their shit. <laughs> One year later, we create NASA. And now Kennedy says, let's go to the moon uh -huh. so that we can show the Russians that you know, we're better. Oh, by the way, while you're going to the moon, can you like do some experiments? So the astronauts take experiments to the moon. My point is, we learned a lot about the moon and its origin and its distance because of experiments that piggybacked that episode right. in our history in space. As President Trump has said in his words, it is not enough to merely have an American presence in space. 
we must have American dominance in space. And so we will. When the Trump administration announced the Space Force, the language Pence was using was we need to like, you know, ma maintain our dominance when it comes to when it comes to space and everything like that. And the idea of a Space Force is essentially just organizing what we're already doing. Not like only that, like, you might throw, oh, because you say that correctly, because there's a huge space component mm -hmm. of what of the duties of the Air Force. Exactly. So you just sort of pull that aside. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes its own thing. Right. Might add or subtract just to trim it. Mm -hmm. But basically, the activities will not be fundamentally different from right. what we're already doing. If we did that, mm -hmm. I would throw in asteroid defense, which is huge because I feel like the threat the threat of asteroids, the threat of you know even just all the debris in space, like this is this is space debris. Space junk. clean that up while you're out there, right? So, <laughs> so that my commerce, right, that you should also be protecting as the military doesn't have a nut or a bolt slammed into my data set, right. okay? What you want to do is protect your assets in space. Right. The assets are measured not just by the value of the hardware that we have orbiting, mm -hmm. but what value it provides for people on Earth. There's a breakdown in the book of that, of how much money there actually is in like telecommunications, and yes. I think a lot of it's people don't huge. really think so about So you that. would want and expect a military to not only protect your borders in the mm -hmm. old traditional sense, right from invaders, you'd want them to protect your assets, particularly when they are very high value. Right. That is a normal function of anybody's military. Mm -hmm. So if we have a space force, but that space force does not include some means of deflecting asteroids, mm -hmm. then I think you're incomplete in your mission statement because I happen to value life on Earth. That's all right. Am I the only one? <laughs> Our presence in space, right. when you contrast it to political instability mm -hmm. on Earth's surface, makes that political instability look so childish <laughs> and so backward. Right. We have educated, talented, um, brave mm -hmm. astronauts in orbit, uh, depending on one another for their survival. And in orbit, when you look down on Earth, you don't see national boundaries. You don't see languages. You don't see skin color. You see oceans, and land, and clouds. You see a planet, and you are above that planet. And someone radios up to you and say, oh, you have to leave the Russian component because we're having fights down here. You know what I would say? <laughs> 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 Actually, what would you oh, say? No. <laughs> I cannot repeat in, in, in mixed company. I, no, I would just, it's like, people, can't we all get along? I'm getting along up here. You're the ones with the problem. That's the G-rated version of what you would say. <laughs> That's the thing. I think, like, um, outside of military interest, there's obviously been a growing amount of interest when it comes to uh, businesses and taking part of it. And space tourism is something that is advancing I think that's pretty a very rapidly. big future. Right, you have, like, Virgin Galactic. You have mm -hmm. uh, Blue Origin getting into the space. And so I feel like... Outside Getting into the space was very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you picked up on that. Yeah. And I know like NASA has made a lot of there's like a big push to have this collaboration with like companies in Silicon Valley and like they're really trying to sure. have this. That this way NASA doesn't have to create or sustain that intellectual capital. Right. You get it from the open market. Right now it's ten thousand dollars a pound to put something in orbit. Right. A pound. Well you know what that means? If I can if I have a spaceship that goes to a comet mm -hmm. and I get a pint of water from that comet. I could sell it to NASA for $9,000. Huh. NASA saves 1000 I earn the money. Because NASA otherwise paid 10000 to get that pint of water into orbit. Right. See, that's the thing. That's what, that's what that's I'm That's what I'm saying in. about the resources. Right. And the resources, you wouldn't necessarily bring them back to Earth. Right. But you would move them to other activities in space. And so the more space becomes civilization's backyard, right. the more that becomes its own business enterprise. What are you excited about in the next, like, 10, 15 years? I have a cop-out answer. Lay it on. And what am I looking forward to? I lose sleep, reflecting, wondering, what are the questions I do not yet know to ask that would only rise up once we make the next round of discoveries in the universe, leaving us with a new vista to stand upon, with new sight lines to reach for. Fade to black. <laughs> 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 <laughs>